to the Gospel according to Matthew. The Gospel according to Matthew and chapter number 16. I want to bring a message uh, to you this morning. Um, and, and as y'all are turning there, <clears throat> y'all ever heard any old, I call them wives tales, but uh, about weather? You know, certain things will tell you what weather it's going to be. What, what's one of them right quick that, that you can think of? It's hurt. If it rains, if it's it's bad weather. Yeah, yeah. If cows laying down bad weather. If the rocks <coughs> wet, it's going to rain or has rain. Yeah, the woolly worm. Yeah. yeah. You young people, maybe y'all just need to listen up to this because this is education. I'm not hurting with that one. Yeah, it rains on Sunday. Same thing. Oh, no. Do you remember the, the persimmon? You know, the persimmon seed? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All of them are very accurate and true, aren't they? Yeah, I don't know. I don't Those aren't always real accurate. Most of the time, they are not real accurate, right? Um, we want to look today in Matthew 16. Uh, what the thought that's on our heart is, I guess you could say, here's your sign. Um, <laughs> signs in and of itself, when you're talking about what we're going to be addressing here in the Bible today, is not in itself a bad thing because Jesus gave signs uh, and he talked about signs of the times and this, that, and the other. Um, but it's kind of the attitude that goes with while, you're, while you are seeking the sign. Uh, that is the problem and he's going to address that in what the Lord has put on my heart to preach on today. Um, so we're just going to start reading here in verse number 1, read the first four verses. It says, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempted, desiring him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. Bow with me for a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for... Lord, safe travels uh, for all that's been uh, gone here and there in the last few weeks, Lord, and those that are on the road now, Lord, I just pray for their safety. And Lord, I just thank you for uh, the privilege to be here today and to preach your word. Lord, we are thankful that you've called us to your salvation. Lord, that you've pulled us out of the miry clay and out of darkness into your marvelous light. And Lord, you've set us on a rock and established your going. Lord God, we're just before you this morning, Lord, asking you once again to forgive me of my sins, Lord. Cleanse me that I can be used by you, a vessel that's fit for your use, Lord. And God, I just pray today that you might preach your word through these lips, bring to remembrance things we've looked at, studied, and thought of, Lord, that needs to be said. Remove those things that does not, Lord. And Father God, I just pray today that as we talk about signs. Lord, you gave a, a big sign to show who you are, that you are God in the flesh. There's none other besides you, Lord. And Father, you've also given us signs for different other things. And Lord, especially for things that are yet to come. And Lord, I just pray that we might pay attention to all of it, Lord. Lord, and we might be looking for you in your return one day, Lord. God, go with us now. Lead God and direct. And Lord, I pray that if there's one here today that is lost, that you would draw them by your spirit to a place
place of repentance, Lord, that they might call on you and be saved by your marvelous grace. We love you. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray and ask these things. Amen. As we, we look at this scripture this morning, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus. And they wanted him to give them a sign to prove that he was the Messiah. That he was who people claimed he was. But Jesus had a pretty harsh and direct answer for them. And I want to go back to what I was talking about a while ago. It's in the attitude they came. They wasn't coming to him to know the truth. They just wanted a trick pony. They just wanted somebody that would perform in front of them to do some miraculous things. Because Jesus had already done plenty of miraculous things. We'll get into that a little bit more in just a few moments. But they also wanted to come to Jesus as ones that had authority over him. They wanted to either show their authority or to prove Jesus a fraud. If Jesus had of, at their bidding, performed some sign or miracle just for them, it would have been him submitting to their authority. He would have done what they wanted to. And so they would have took away from Jesus' authority. But then on the other hand also, him not doing it, they could say, ah, oh, you've claimed to be the Messiah, that you're the Son of God, that you're somebody, yet yeah, you can't even perform some little miracle to prove that you are. Now you would think, this kind of is a problem for Jesus. I mean, he's, he, he, it's kind of a catch-22 kind of thing. If he does, does it this way, then there's an issue. If he uh, does it this way, then there's an issue. But what did Jesus then go on to start telling them? We'll skip on down and go ahead and make mention uh, down there about the sign of the prophet Jonah. And we're going to get into that a little bit more in a few moments. He didn't do the miracle. But he said he wasn't going to do a sign. He said, just wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's going to be one given that is undeniable uh, that will show and prove to this whole world that I am in fact the Son of God. And it's going to be like the sign of Jonah the prophet. That was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale and came out. Listen. We're going to get into that, like I said, a few, in a few moments a little bit deeper. Uh, but Jesus was, what, three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. And he came out victorious over death, hell and the grave, amen, and proved that was all the sign any of them ever needed right there. It's all the sign I need to know that they put uh, my God uh, in the ground and the ground couldn't hold on to him, that death couldn't hold on to him. And because he lives, I'm going to live also, Amen. It's all the sign any of us need. But he goes on down through here, and I want to go through these verses a little bit. He said in verse 2, he said, He answered, said unto them, When it is evening, he said, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, in, in verse 3, and in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. So he, he gives them something they're familiar with. This is one of those old wives' tales we talk about. I haven't heard it quite like what you said it. Uh, the way I've heard it is uh, red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. Y'all may have heard it a little bit different. This is one of the only, only, this is one of the few of those things that has some truth to it. The science behind that statement, and I think, it, and I'm, I'm going to say this because I think it's amazing that here we have 2,000 years ago in the Word of God, Jesus doesn't discredit it. Ah, that's just an old saying. He already knew the science behind it. Amen? And science had just recently caught up in the meteorological sense. But the reason they can say that uh, a statement as, as, it's not 100%, I'm just going to say that, not 100%, but it has credibility to it, 
is because the way light refracts through the atmosphere. When in the morning and in the evening the sun's at its lowest uh, degree in the sky, and as the, the light beams come through, there's water particles and dust particles and things like that in the atmosphere. And as the light filters through the red wavelengths, which red, orange, yellow, down through there, are longer than like the blues, greens, and purple wavelengths of light. The red ones get through the particles. That's why we can see that beautiful, everybody loves a beautiful red sky, right? The bluer wavelengths break up going through all those particles. And so you don't see that as prominent. You see the red more prominent. And so what that means is there is normally a high pressure system that's allowing all those extra particles to be in the air instead of blowing on through that's causing the light to do that. And when there's a high pressure system, generally it's going to mean that there's going to be good weather. And a lot of times in the evening that's what you'll see. If it's in the morning on the reverse of that, and you see that red sky, it can mean that the high pressure system has already come through and it's leaving, which can mean a storm is coming, or it could also mean there is more water particles in the air, which leads to rain. Y'all got all that science lesson down now? You got all that? So now y'all know how to do your farming when you look at the sky, right? No? All right. Google it. That's all I can say. That's what I had to do because I didn't know all that. I had to Google it and see if there's any merit to it. It turns out there was. Jesus, though I say all that to tell you, they could look at the sky and they could uh, just, just, just from looking at it, guess, well, it's going to be good weather. It's going to be bad weather for a little while. And they would use that as a sign. And Jesus was getting on to it and says, you can tell what the weather's going to do over looking at something, but yet you can't tell who I am by me telling you who I am and by all those that's been healed, healed. All those that's been raised from the dead, raised. All those that's been helped by me. You can't tell that I am who I say I am. You see, that was the issue. They wanted somebody just to be a performer for them. Just to keep performing to prove who he is or says he is. see the truth. And down here in verse 4, he calls them, said, you're a wicked and adulterous generation that seeketh after a sign. Now I got to thinking about that. That's pretty harsh. Because whether we all want to admit it, any of y'all ever sought after a sign? Mm-hmm. Sure. We, we want, well, if this will happen, then I'll know I'm supposed to do whatever, you know. Right? We've all done that. But here he tells them that you're an evil and adulterous generation that seek after a sign. And I want you to understand, he was talking specifically about them addressing him and who he was and the sign that they wanted was uh, for him to do something to keep proving and keep proving. Do you think one sign would have been enough after that? Do you think he could have done something else miraculous in front of them as we were wrong about you. You are the Messiah. They'd have to have another one. Then another one. Then another one. Sometimes we can be like that a little bit. Amen. Lord, I know you done this for me yesterday, but today you got to prove to me 
how big a God you are again, we do that. Sometimes. But they were, they were uh, wanting someone different. And if Jesus couldn't ante up, if you will, if He couldn't measure up, if He couldn't uh, perform to their standards, they were going to look for somebody else. And that's why He called them an evil and adulterous generation. Because they weren't satisfied with Him just being God. He wanted them, uh, or they wanted Him to uh, be, be their little, uh, His little, or their little trick person, their little magician, if you will. Wanted them to be what they wanted in their own little box. And wouldn't accept Him for who He is. And if He would not perform for them, they said, we're going to look for somebody else. I appreciate what you said earlier, sister, these young people. And I'm just going to go ahead and get on my soapbox now to these young people as well. Be careful who you look for in a mate. And I'm going to tell you right now, social media is... is a big black eye on relationships. I'll just put it that way. Because you get on there and everybody's got to one-up everybody on everything they do. Right? Did you ever do any prom proposals? <laughs> you didn't do nothing. Yeah, I said you don't want to <laughs> You know, and if you've done a prom proposal, don't, I, I'm not getting on to you. I'm just telling you. The modern age romance is a new creation. It ain't like it used to be. It's all about performance now. And if you don't perform as well as this one over here, and you make a big spectacle like this one over here did, that they put all over Facebook and TikTok and whatever else there is out there, then I'm going to find me somebody else. I'm just going to tell you something, ladies. Don't look for the best performer when you're looking for a mate. Uh, look for someone who is present, who is there, who cares, who wants to provide, who uh, plans on sticking by you through thick and thin. Amen? Amen. Amen. Guys, be that man. Amen? Don't look for the flashy stuff. Because I'm going to tell you something. You know, a lot of people say, well, uh, ones like that, they'll love you and leave you. No, they won't. They'll lust you and leave you. Y'all understand the difference between that? There's a difference between love and lust. So now, that's your bonus for the day. He called them a wicked and adulterous generation because they wanted someone different. Because Jesus, if he didn't measure up, they was going to look for somebody else. And Jesus told them there, he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to give you a sign. It's not going to be the one you want, the one you're looking for, but it's going to be the most powerful one. He said it's going to be the sign of the prophet Jonas. Now, if you'll turn with me, I just got a couple places more we want to turn briefly. Matthew chapter 12. All of them's in Matthew. Matthew chapter 12 uh, Jesus, this wasn't Jesus' first conversation with Pharisees and Sadducees on this very exact subject. He had to address them uh, again over this. And even one place in the Bible, in the Gospel of John, it's, I believe it, it, it's either John or in Corinthians. Can't remember right now some of the things I've studied uh, which one, but it, it says that the Jews seek after a sign. I believe that was in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Jews seek after a sign. I always wanted to have it proved. In Matthew chapter 12, in verse 38, it says, And certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. In other words, time for you to perform. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, or Jonas. Uh, Jonas is the Greek form of Jonah. <clears throat> For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, <coughs> a greater than Jonas is here. 
Jesus expounded on to it a little bit more about what that sign is. And he gave what I told you a while ago is Jonah was uh, three days in the belly of the whale. It was a, a symbolic of death. But see, Jonah wasn't dead. Jonah just wished he was. Jonah was three days in the belly of that whale of a great fish because he had run from God and what God wanted him to do. And then on that third day, the whale spit him back up on the dry land because God had an appointment that he was going to keep. Let me just say, don't run from God when God wants you to do something. I don't know what it's like to be in the belly of a fish, but I've seen fish that's been in the belly of a fish. And it's not pretty. I wouldn't want to be there. And so this great fish spit Jonah back up on the land. And Jonah went straight to where he was supposed to go. Not wanting to, but he went. You see, he was supposed to go warn Nineveh. Nineveh was Israel's enemies. And God wanted him to warn uh, the enemies of Israel that unless they repented, God was going to bring destruction on them. Jonah was all right with destruction being brought on them. That's why he ran to start with. He said, no, it suits me fine. Go ahead and wipe them out. But God said, there's a lot of people there that's young that don't know any difference. Don't know the right hand from the left hand. Innocent. That's the ones that he was being sent for. Plus any others that would repent. And so Jonah went down there. And you think, why would this Jew have any credibility with anybody in Nineveh? I'm going to tell you, being three days in the belly of a fish is going to have some effects on you. Not just up here. And changing your mind and things about situations. Being in stomach acid. He stunk. His skin would have been discolored. He'd been more yellow. And he'd have been he'd been slicker than you, brother. <laughs> slicker than I will be one day. He had different uh, definite signs about him of where he said he had been. And it brought credibility to what he was coming to do. And he told them, he didn't preach no long extravagant sermon because he really still didn't want them to, to, to be spared. He wanted them to be destroyed. He just preached a little short one and said, lest y'all repent, this is me paraphrasing, lest y'all repent, in so many days, God's going to wipe you off the face of the earth. The end. Because he'd come from where he was, he had the credentials then the people in Nineveh repented and were saved God's judgment. Jesus is telling the Pharisees here that those people that were the enemies is going to rise up in judgment against you because they heard, they seen a little bit of sign from Jonah, undeniable sign. They heard the few words that he spoke and yet the whole town repented. Everybody there repented. And they were spared. And Jesus is telling them, even though you have seen the lame walk, the eyes of the blind opened, and you've even said to yourself that you've never seen it all in this manner before, and who can do it but God? You've heard the dumb to speak, the deaf to hear, even though you have experienced that, let alone the thousands fed with five loaves and a couple fish, you've seen all this proof. Jesus is telling them that I am who I say I am, yet you want more. Nineveh didn't require that much and they repented and they're going to rise up in judgment against you. 
I'm just going to tell you, we've all seen proof of God being exactly who God says He is. Have we not? God forgive us when we question it. And we ask God, you're going to have to show us another sign. God forgive us of that. And I say, God help grant us the faith that we need just to believe He is because He says He is and not just because He says He is, but He's proved it over and over and over to us. And He'll keep proving it to us. One more place and I'm going to be done. Matthew chapter 24. What we just talked about was the greatest sign that Jesus could give to prove He was and is God in the flesh. He laid down His life on that cross and then of His own power picked it back up again. No man, that's just a man, can do that. Only God. And a great big God at that. Amen? Can do that sort of thing. But now there is more signs to come. In chapter 24, verse number 1, we'll just read the first three today. It says that Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the mount of all his disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And I'll stop there. And this is why I say signs in themselves ain't bad, because Jesus didn't call them, you vile, wretched, uh, adulterous generation. He didn't tell them that. They actually wanted to know what to look for. The sign of the coming in. Their heart was in the right place when they asked it. And Jesus goes on to expound, and Lord willing, I'm going to preach on that next week, the rest of chapter 24. But Jesus starts to give them and tell them some things that are going to happen. And in one verse on down in verse in chapter 24, it talks about when the fig leaves start putting out the shoots. You know that summer's nigh. You know what comes after that. When we see leaves start coming on the trees, we know that spring's here and summer's coming, right? I mean, it, it's that one's accurate. Every year. When you see the leaves start falling off the trees, that's supposed to fall off of what's coming. Winter. Fall winter. He's given us seasons for a sign of times. But Jesus tells them if you see those things start happening, you know what's coming next. In the verses in chapter 24, he says, when you see these things start happening, this is what you need to be looking to happen next. He was warning them about a storm. Of biblical proportions that's coming. And not a Noah's day storm. It's going to be a storm greater than that. Amen. It's going to be a storm first by Antichrist and all those that would follow him, followed up by a storm of the wrath of God upon all them that followed Antichrist. And we're not going to get into it too much today because that's, Lord willing, that'll be next week's message. But I want you to know today that a storm is coming. A storm is brewing. And we need to pay attention and open our eyes. Amen? Amen. The only thing can save you, that can rescue you, that can alleviate what's coming with this storm by what Jesus talked about what that other sign was. 
His resurrection. You believing and trusting in Him fully in who He is is the only thing going to save you from the wrath of God to come. That storm that's brewing. Now, I don't know anybody's heart out here this morning. I know some's testimony that they are saved. Some's testimony that they're not saved. And I just want to ask those that are not saved out here today, what sign are you looking for to be saved? The only thing you should be looking for is the Holy Spirit pounding on that heart right now. Telling you that you're lost and you need to be saved. That you need to repent. I've talked to some and said, well, I was waiting for them to sing a certain song. And if they would sing a certain song, I knew it was my time to be saved. Let me tell you something, if you know the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart and He's telling you you're lost, now is the time to be saved. Amen? Regardless of if we sing or we don't sing. If I preach or I don't preach. Or if so-and-so testifies or they don't testify. I've heard all those things. I wanted a sign of this one preaching or this one singing a certain song or us singing this certain congregational song. Listen, that's dangerous. What you need to be looking for is if the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart right now. That's your sign that you need to be saved. The same way as when He tells you and He grants you that peace of God in your heart, knowing that all is well between you and God, that's your sign to know you are saved. The same one who does convict is the same one who does the telling that you are saved. I can't do it. Deacons can't do it. Song leaders can't do it. Sunday school teachers can't do it. Nobody in here can do it. But God can. Amen? So what are you looking for today? What sign from God are you looking for today? I'm just going to tell you. If you're waiting for a certain song to be played, go ahead and tell us and we'll sing it for you. Amen? Because we want you to be saved. We don't want you to wait and put your eternal life in jeopardy. Amen? Because when you put it off, you put that in jeopardy. I'm not being able to come to that moment that you turn it all over to God and yield your heart to Him and be fully saved. We're going to stand, we're going to sing a verse of song with your one guy. And I'm just telling you, if God is dealing with you, don't seek for anything else but Him this morning. He's the only thing that matters. Don't be seeking, well, if this happens or this happens or whatever. Listen, God's given you the sign that you need. He rose from the dead after being in that ground for three days. He wants you to be saved if He is dealing with your heart right now. Don't look for other things. While we stand and while we sing, would you come? Thank you.